thanks uh, to Fresno Audubon for, for having me as well. Uh, I am um, a longtime resident of the Sierra. I live in a town called Mid Pines and worked in the park for almost a decade, uh, but choose to still make my home here, even though I do a lot of work in LA or, or did uh, before the pandemic hit. Uh, I just love the area. Uh, I love the Sierra. Uh, Yosemite is uh, what I call my North Star. And of course, uh, being a wildlife conservationist, love the wildlife of Yosemite. Um, I also worked in Yellowstone National Park. And yeah, I, I think the characterization that Yellowstone is, you know, you go for the wildlife in Yosemite for the scenery is a little bit true, but we have some pretty cool wildlife in Yosemite too. And I'm gonna highlight some of them tonight uh, in my presentation. Um, it was hard to choose what to highlight. We have, we have a lot of incredible stuff. Let me see if I can... Um, and this just shows, I think, my two lives. Again, you get one in Yosemite, and then I'm very urban when I work on urban wildlife um, in, in Los Angeles. Uh, oh, and why is my, there we go. Uh, I also am the author of uh, two books on wildlife, one when mountain lions are neighbors, and the other is I Heart Wildlife that just came out. Uh, that talk about wildlife across California and across the world. And for me, it's about celebrating the wonder. I think if uh, those of you who may be on here who know me, uh, I have to work with a lot of bad news, but, and I have to fight a lot, you know, and advocate a lot, but I like to celebrate what's right and what connects us to wildlife. And I think that's a lot what my talk's going to be tonight. You'll get some science, but I really want to like sort of reconnect you to what's just wondrous and marvelous about the wildlife in our backyards. Um, and what I do in LA real quick, which I think is an incredible story, is I work to build a wildlife crossing for mountain lions down there. And you may say LA has mountain lions. They sure do. And this is the famous one named P-22. He lives in Griffith Park. But the, their mountain lions are actually having a lot of issues uh, because of the roadways. Uh, genetically, they're becoming isolated so much so they're inbreeding themselves out of existence. So I'm working to build uh, what's going to be the world's largest wildlife crossing down there uh, to help make sure these mountain lions stay on the landscape. And this is a, a photo last summer of myself giving Governor Newsom a tour. This is something like widely supported by the state. And this is what it's going to look like done. So I think, you know, the reason I, I sort of preface this was whatever talk I do that wildlife's not just about the Yosemites. We now know from science, we need protections everywhere, even in our most urban of spaces. And I think if LA can do this, you know, nobody's got any excuse for, for helping wildlife, even in our, our sort of more, you know, cities that we don't tend to think of as being wildlife friendly. So it's a pretty cool project. And, you know, having worked in Yosemite, having worked in Yellowstone, I never thought I'd find myself focusing on urban wildlife and mountain lions dating lives in LA, but it's pretty cool. Um, but I will say my bias is what I like to spend most of my time doing and this pandemic, there's not a lot of good points to this pandemic. In fact, I can think of very few except for, I actually, even though I live up here, I usually on the road about 70 to 80% of the time and mostly in LA, but mm -hmm. this, this year with the pandemic has been really wonderful. Uh, at least again, not a lot of good stuff, but for me, being able to I, you know, get hikes in more regularly in Yosemite and wander um, has been incredible. And it was incredible for really tracking the wildlife. I've been doing sort of a biodiversity survey up here outside the park and in the park for about 10 years now, but I was really able to see, you know, day by day changes in a way I hadn't. So um, that's pretty incredible. Um, but these are the places I always like to start with a sense of place. Some of you who love Yosemite may be familiar with these places. This is Gala Lakes Basin. Uh, this is where I do a lot of my pika and butterfly surveys. Uh, what you're looking at is a ridge that's looking at to your, uh, I guess that's your left, it would be Gaylor Lake. There is granite, the two sort of parts of granite lakes there. And you're looking at sort of the cathedral range in the distance. This is Gaylor Lake. Um, many of you probably hiked to this. It's a pretty popular hike in Yosemite, right near Toga Pass. And again, you can see the Cathedral Range. You can see Cathedral Peak and Unicorn, Unicorn in the, the distance there. Um, this is where I do some of my butterfly surveys. Uh, I do a lot off trail. In fact, I'm almost never on trail these days. And I just, you know, this is just such an incredible area. This is about 11,200 feet. And this is in, uh, you know, early springtime. The wildflowers haven't quite come out yet. Um, but believe it or not, this is pretty good butterfly habitat and pretty good pika habitat. 
and it's just you know yosemite's just there there's no place like on earth you know that that, that compares to it in my mind uh, let's see this is you can see the wildflowers starting to come up that's mount dana right in the middle there for those of you who and this is pretty cool i wanted to share this because the Yosemite Winter Rangers, if you don't follow them or uh, they, they, the Yosemite National Park Facebook page shares their stuff a lot. Um, they post incredible photos and reports from, you know, they're up there all winter. And they took a photo recently of my butterfly survey site. It's not quite the exact thing, but pretty close. It's really fun to see what this looked like in the winter because I'm not that big a skier. So, you know, uh, it's, I've never been up there in the winter. So it was pretty cool to see that. Another place that I do, uh, you know, I'm out there surveying for wildlife is the Dana Plateau. It, technically, it's right outside the park, but it's on the border. This is an incredible landscape. Uh, there's nothing like it. If I have a favorite place in Yosemite, it's probably here, just because uh, it missed the last few glaciations. So the landscape, essentially, if you read King Huber's book, his theory is it's been untouched, really, by any major force for about 25 million years. And indeed, you know, though this is Glacier Canyon, um, this is a view of the Dana Plateau, and you can see it's just, it's two miles of this incredible open plateau um, that doesn't have sort of the, you know, when glaciers come through, they shape the rock. This is just sort of flat and open, and uh, it's, it's incredible. Uh, you can see the top there, you just, Kness just went by, and that's the uh, sort of edge of Dana. Um, here is a view of what I call in the Dana Plateau, the, the Garden of Rocks. These rocks have essentially been up there for millions of years and only shaped by water and wind. And they're these incredible, they look like Mars rocks, these incredible formations of rock up there. Um, and again, butterfly migration path, interestingly enough, which is pretty cool. You see butterflies and I'll show some video coming over that ridge there. So um, these are some pretty special places. And here's the middle of the plateau just uh, walking down a creek. Uh, it's just, you know, these lands, that's Mount Kness way in the background there, if you want to give you a sense of place. So, you know, these areas are incredible. And then the last place I sort of regularly survey is the Kuna Crest, uh, which that, uh, that's Kuna Lake. Um, this is the top of the Kuna Crest. Uh, you have uh, Gibbs and Dana that you're sort of looking in that direction. Uh, and this was last spring. I mean, just a wonderful wildflower year. Uh, and here's some other views from the top of the Kuna Crest. And here's a little video to give you a sense of place as well. So those are, I just like to give people a sense of where I'm at, where I'm showing most, not all, but most of these, these wildlife photos from. I, you know, I was, I have a couple talks I do. I mean, one's just sort of a, you know, here's all the wildlife we have in Yosemite, but I wanted to sort of focus on some animals for you that are special to me and that I study in depth. So you sort of get more an in-depth than sort of a biological survey. But since this is Yosemite, I mean, since this is Fresno Audubon, I figured I needed to start with some birds. Uh, so uh, I picked some of my best bird encounters. I'm a terrible birder. I have to admit, I've gotten better with raptors, I guess, red tail hawks a lot. But um, uh, these are some of my mem memorable bird encounters. This one was literally last week, this northern pygmy owl. And, and full disclosure, this was a little outside the park, but swooped down in front of me. And, you know, I think it was noon, and it's, I don't know if it's hard to see on the screen, but you can see it has an alligator lizard and just stared at me like, you're not getting my lunch. And I'm like, I don't want it. Um, one of my favorite birds is the Clark Nutcracker. I think, you know, you guys are birders. I don't have to go into too much detail. These are remarkable birds. They don't migrate. They, you know, they can seed caches up to, you know, 9,000, 10,000 seed caches. They know by sight, they can find them under snow. Uh, I just, and they're really noisy though. It's the only thing I don't like. I'm, you know, I'll be out pika watching and enjoying the peace and boy, it, you know, like a jay, they are really noisy. Um, gray crown rosy finch, uh, God, these are incredible birds. You know, you, you see them at the higher elevation. And when I first started seeing them, I had no idea what they were. I was like, what are these birds that I always see up high when I'm looking for early pika? Um, but uh, I think they're just beautiful birds with that crown. When you are sitting watching pika, you see a lot of raptors and uh, bald eagles, no exception. They tend to like, I don't know if they're after the pika per se as some of the larger animals that 
like marmots or ground squirrels that share the site. But uh, I've been lucky enough to see quite a few bald eagles. Uh, mountain bluebirds, I, I just love seeing them. You know, at my elevation where I live in Mid Pines, I have the Western bluebird, but these come out at high elevations. Uh, like uh, sooty grouse, I, I often hear them more than I see them, but a few times have been lucky enough to, to actually see these guys. And then I didn't even know this bird existed till this year. Again, I'm a, I'm a terrible birder. Um, I was like, what is that? I was sitting watching uh, a pika that, named Petey, which I'll show you later on. I'm like, that, is that a, what is that? It just sort of looks like a, like a cartoony Dr. Seuss and uh, turned out to be a, a green-tailed toey, which is now one of my new favorite birds. I think they're really comical looking. Um, but I wanted to end with my memorable bird sightings. I think this is the bird that kind of made me want to be a better birder. Um, some of you might remember, uh, was it 2012? It was 2012, I'm pretty sure. Um, Toga Pass stayed open record. Like you could get up there in January. There was no water. So I was up there not loving it because it wasn't, you know, it wasn't good with climate change and what it did to the ecosystem. But I was at least loving being able to hike literally in shorts at Toga Pass in December and January. And I was on the going up to the Dana Plateau and I, I snapped this photo like, oh, raptor post it to Facebook and I'm like, hey, anybody know what this is? And the thing went worldwide viral. Like, I guess it was not a usual thing to see a Northern Goshawk up there this time of year. So it kind of like, oh, okay, maybe birds are kind of cool and I should get to know them more. So uh, this was sort of the, the, the bird that made me want to be a better birder. Uh, okay, come on, there we go. So let me start with some animals I just want to uh, want to talk about. Um, and I think ones that fascinate me, and these are in no particular order. The first one is the Sierra Newt. And I will, all these Newt photos are actually outside the park uh, in the Merced River Canyon, but we do have Sierra Newts in the park. I just don't have any good photos of them in there. But uh, the Newts are out right now. Um, they're having a tough time. Uh, you know, the water is not at the levels we need them. And this is the time they actually journey to their, their breeding grounds. Um, but these guys are remarkable. They live for up to 20 years, you know, basically they only have really the, the garter snake that can eat them because they are toxic, you know, have toxins that can actually be quite harmful to us as well. But they look like, you know, water dogs is their nickname. And, you know, they go back to the same breeding grounds every year and they just have this incredible ambling uh, trait that I just love. And I love that we have our own species uh, in the Sierra. Uh, the California newt is more widespread. Um, they do look like little dogs to me, and they're pretty remarkable little critters that I think we should celebrate and also watch out for. Uh, I think, you know, one of the things that's impacting them is increased recreation. You know, they are really slow moving. Um, you know, if, if you're on a bike or a horse or even hiking and you're not watching out, uh, these guys can get in the way. So I'm, I'm getting particularly worried about these uh, these guys with increased recreation and um, in car traffic as well. They certainly get out. I've moved uh, quite a few of them off the road or off trail. Here's one going across uh, the trail, just this little slow trait, um, pretty cool little critters. And I, you know, I love to think they've been sort of taking the same path to their breeding grounds for 20 years. That's a pretty good lifespan for a little critter, I have to say. Uh, but anyway, that, that's one of my favorites up here is the, the Sierra Newt. But my all-time favorite, uh, and it's hard to pick favorites, but is the pika. Um, I, you know, it's, I can't see everybody, but I'd ask to show, or if you want to put in the comments, uh, you know, how many have seen a pika? You're Again, a little more likely to hear them than see them. Although if you're patient and take your time, they'll come out. And I think that's how I've evolved. You know, in my younger years, I was like, I got to get to the top peak and I got to finish this hike. These days, it's just about, okay, I'm just going to go out and I'll stop where I want. And, you know, oh, that butterfly, let me follow. So, you know, really getting out of that mode of I have to complete a hike and, you know, you're bird watchers. I don't need to tell you this, you know, staying still and watching, uh, you know, these, these critters will come out. Um, but they, I, I think we can all agree, they're one of the most cute, ridiculously cute animals on the planet. So uh, it's, 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 you know, it's no hardship to sit and look at these guys. And I'm seeing people uh, like Polly Kim, Mount Rainer, um, Fresno Audubon Society, uh, whoever that is, Lassen National Park, uh, Anne from, oh, Point Blue Conservation. Hello, Anne. Anne I, actually, I knew Anne. Um, I've seen Pike in the Tetons, Wyoming. Yes, they are just adorable. Um, even their poop, 
is adorable. So that is pica poop. Uh, it's these little hard pellets. They actually keep recycling them until they're hard. And indeed, uh, these pellets will last so long that pica scientists can actually look at historic sites and actually can carbon date, you know, because these hard pellets in their final form last long. I don't know, you know, that's a lot of pica poop for a little guy. Obviously, this is a historic uh, pica poop. There's some pica poop up close because I know who doesn't want to see uh, pica poop during a talk. Um, they also eat poop. Uh, this is a pica with marmot poop. And they actually will uh, eat poop as part of their sort of uh, uh, diet. Uh, here's a young pica uh, I took. A lot of these are from the Gala Lake site that I study, but there's others too. And you have to be, you know, again, I don't have to tell birders to be patient, but you have to be really patient uh, to, to learn how to cite pica. I don't know if you in this photo can see where the pica is, but they are very well camouflaged. So you really have to get good at finding where these little guys are hanging out. And what I tell people is don't look for a pica, look for motion. You have to kind of wait till they move and then bams um, and they move fast. Um, I love them because they look like little fluffy potatoes. Look at that little guy, right? Um, and here's just, you know, I'll, I'll show pica photos, you know, I'll just flip through a million of them. They also move incredibly fast. These guys just fly across the rocks, which obviously is an adaptation to avoiding predation. One of the things I find quite remarkable about them is their resiliency. They live at high elevations for the most part, except for there are some populations of the American pika, like in the Columbia River Gorge that are actually living at low elevations. But in the Sierra and the Rockies, they are living at 10, you know, 12, even 13,000 feet, and they don't hibernate. It's pretty incredible. What they do is they gather vegetation and then let it dry in the sun like hay and those hay piles then become their food under snow in the winter. And these are just some photos of pika either eating or gathering their hay piles, which again, makes them even more adorable with these, you know, sort of bouquets of greenery as they dash across the rocks. Look at that little face, how can you resist it? And this is what a hay pile looks like. And it's really interesting to track these hay piles. Um, uh, the, one of the pikas I'll get to, Sophie, like her hay pile is pretty much the same year to year, but it looks very different than Petey, another pika's hay pile. So they really are looking at what vegetation is around them. These guys are organized too. They layer their hay pile so that like plants that have uh, toxins that, you know, until they've sort of aged out are at the bottom so that they eat them at the right time. Like this is a well-organized pantry. It's pretty incredible. You can contrast different this hay pile, which is a different one. The other thing I like to tell people about pika, their butts are adorable. Look at that. Uh, you know, little pajama bottom feet and, you know, little sort of teddy bear butts. So it's always fun to catch a, 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 a photo of a pika butt. Uh, and there's a, you know, again, I'll just show uh, photos of pika all day. In fact, if you haven't gotten enough pika, uh, is it next week I'm doing for the Sierra Nevada Alliance. I just joined their board. Uh, a talk I call Pika Palooza. So if you want more about Pika, uh, that's next week. Um, but here are two Pika. Uh, you know, I am one of those scientists that listen. Animals have distinct personalities. Um, they're not human, but you know, listen. They're they're individuals. They're not sort of these groups. And um, Pika can be hard to ID uh, just because they all look alike, but they have very distinct territories. So you can track them a little bit by that. And I have been tracking for the last two years, these two pika, one is called Sophie, and this is where she lives. She's at Gaylor Lakes. And she's a very friendly pika. She'll come out and just, I'll be eating my lunch or just sitting there. And she's very comfortable just sort of looking at me and she'll eat. And you can see she's got a little character. And then there's Petey, he's a little shyer. He's a little more wary of who I am. I think he's gotten a little used to me. Um, and this is Petey giving a call. I, this is what a pika sounds like if you've never heard. They have elaborate alarm calls. Uh, they have elaborate, like, you know, they are sounding the alarm on predators. Um, and this is where Petey lives. And he is, he's a pretty cute little guy as well. That's his, hey, what are you doing here look. Um, and then Petey's a little shy for another reason. Uh, one of the last times I was up there before the pass closed this year, I was like, where's Petey? He hasn't come out. And then all of a sudden, weasel. And uh, I have seen weasel in my, uh, but I've never gotten a picture of one that was good until now. And it was pretty incredible to watch 
this little guy run across the rocks. Although if you're a pika, I'm sure it's quite terrifying to see this come out to you. I'm happy to report Petey was fine. He came back uh, uh, about an hour later and was like, oh my God, I survived that. Um, if you are pika watching, you also uh, see a lot of marmots. Uh, although marmots are, you know, I, I tell people if I'm gonna come back as, uh, yes, uh, Rachel, it is a long-tailed weasel. Uh, and Anne saying, seeing them in Canada. Yeah, long-tailed weasel. Um, marmots are the animal you want to come back as if you're reincarnated. They spend uh, most of their time in hibernation. They hibernate a long time, like eight months, nine months. And then when they aren't hibernating, um, they spend about 90% of their time napping in dens or the other 10% of their time napping outside in the sun. They are a very zen animal that you know, just, I think, has a, a pretty good life up there. Um, and uh, when I was pika watching this summer, I caught these five marmot babies coming out. It was really cool. I'd never seen a marmot baby before. So uh, it was um, really amazing. Um, Someone asked, will wolves go after pika? Interestingly enough, I'm gonna talk about wolves as my last animal, but they're a little small. Uh, pika are pretty good at evading things, even raptors, because they're so fast. Um, weasel is probably their nemesis, just because the weasels can get in the same space as they can. Um, and then I'll skip the, the marmot quiz. Um, that was from my book. I have a marmot quiz in one of my books, but we'll skip it for tonight. Another animal that is incredible that we need to be proud of is the Yosemite toad. Uh, again, I just, you know, wildlife fascinates me what they're able to do. You know, we think humans are at the top. No way. Wildlife does things we wouldn't, uh, we wouldn't do. Like, would you swim through a cold near freezing pool of water and walk across snow in your bare feet for a day? I didn't think so, but this toad does. Uh, the Yosemite toad only exists in the Sierra, so they're an endemic here. And we don't know a lot about them. Uh, my neighbor, Rob Grasso, is a pretty incredible aquatic biologist up here, and he's been studying them. Um, they're getting some really cool footage going into these frozen lakes in the winter with you know, sort of remote cameras to see what they do. So some of that mystery is being dispelled. But these guys, you know, they come to their breeding grounds right when the snow melts, um, as the snow is melting. And if I can get this to play, come on. There we go. I, looking for mates. And when I first heard years ago the sound, I thought it was a bird. I'm going to play the sound to you. I'm like, what is that I am hearing? It's, it's loud. I mean, the whole basin is filled with this trilling I'll play you. And it's the Yosemite toads calling for a mate. Um, and they will, they'll walk a mile or more over snow to, to their sort of little breeding pond that they historically share. And I'm zooming out here so you can get a sense. This is actually Lower Gaylor Lake is a pretty good uh, site for where these guys come out. And it's tricky to catch it. I mean, Toga Pass sometimes doesn't open uh, in time. By the time you get there, the, the Yosemite toads have all made it. You miss this singing season. Um, but sometimes, like this year, I hit it just right, although I had to work for that. That was uh, about two miles over sun cups to get to that. Uh, so that was not the easiest thing to get this footage, but it was pretty marvelous. Um, let's see, come on. What's going on? Technology. Uh, this is what a Yosemite toad sounds like. So just picture hundreds of those toads doing that sound at the same time. I mean, it is a beautiful, you know, sympathy. It is just incredible. Um, so they're looking for dates, right? And I'll tell you, uh, female, being a female in the Yosemite toad is not all it's cracked up to be. The males outnumber the females about 10 to 1. So you get into situations like this where in Amplexus, they are kind of uh, fighting over you. Um, somebody put it doesn't sound like anything like a frog. Or amphibian in my I agree. Like I said, I thought it was a I thought it was a bird. Um, Susan Joy says, uh, I love the work you're doing in SoCal for mountain lions. Uh, thank you. It, I, again, I never thought I'd be, you know, doing dating lives for mountain lions in Southern California, but I love it. LA is doing a lot for wildlife. I, you know, it's pretty inspirational. Um, but again, Yosemite's got my heart. Um, and I just I love this footage of this is again um 
right at Glacier Canyon going up the Dana Plateau and you had, this was late season, you had one toad who hadn't given up and I love this. You can sort of hear him a little bit. So, you know, he hadn't given up. He was still looking for love even late in the season. Um, also, uh, you know, coyotes. I, you know, we tend to think of coyotes as uh, urban dwellers. And I, even though I get coyotes on my webcam, I don't see them a lot. But um, I like to show this photo of a coyote just because when I was looking for Yosemite toads um, two years in a row, the same coyote came out to say hello. It was early spring. I always try to get up there as soon as possible. And the reason I know that is he had a scar. And he sort of, it was sort of like his, hey, spring's here. You know, the Yosemite toad woman's here. So it was kind of a, a really cool encounter. And he'd sort of hang out and watch what I was doing. Like, why is she kneeling down looking at these little frogs? Um, but again, that's, you know, being up there, being still, you get these really incredible wildlife encounters. And I actually see more coyotes in LA than I do at my home here outside Yosemite or even in the park. But I like seeing the wild coyotes, you know, not, um, so much uh, trotting down, uh, you know, Sunset Boulevard in, in LA. Uh, another, uh, I'm going to spend a little time or, or a lot of time maybe on butterflies. This is something I've gotten really into the last few years. I don't pretend to be an expert, but I am um, just in love with butterflies and especially the alpine butterflies. Um, I am amazed at the resiliency of all wildlife, but that you have these tiny little butterflies who make these migrations at 12,000 feet that I'm huffing and puffing to get over. Um, and we have an incredible diversity. Of course, Mariposa County, which I live in, is named for butterfly. But I'm amazed now that my eyes are open, you know, when I'm pica watching, I just, you know, the species of butterfly we have in the Sierra are really incredible. And again, we're home to some of the, the butterfly migrations like the painted lady or the California tortoise shell. Um, some butterflies, um, you know, some of these you have in Fresno, the California sister. I mean, I, that, what an incredibly beautiful butterfly with those blues, the morning cloak. Uh, the Sarah Orange Tip, which you're out right now, I'm not sure uh, what's out at your elevation, but these guys have been racing up Merced River Canyon now for about a month. We're having an early butterfly season, I think. I'm trying to compare to my past sightings um, just because you know, I, and I, I've noticed that the uh, chorus frogs and areas where usually they're laying uh, eggs later are out already. Um, I think it's going to be an early spring, sadly, because I know we still need water. My cat would like to join the presentation. She knows she's not officially some new wildlife, but you know, she likes attention. Um, common buckeye, I think it needs a new name because there's nothing uh, common about this incredible butterfly. And then the blues. Uh, blues, good Lord, it is. these are really tricky to ID. I think I've gotten some down. And by the way, if I put a species ID up on a photo, I've had that confirmed by a scientist. Um, so you can, you can rest assured for at least the species IDs I'm doing. One butterfly that's out now, and we, again, this, this butterfly is just in California, um, I think uh, a little in Mexico maybe, I'm forgetting, but uh, definitely the Sierra Foothills, but they're locally very rare. So although they have sort of a wide range in California, they're just in a lot of pockets. And we have a pocket up here. Um, I'm seeing about 10 of these a day right now. And some of my butterfly friends who like live in, you know, Sacramento, like, what? Oh my God, we don't see that many. Um, look at that beautiful butterfly. That's a female with four orange. The males have two. Um, it's a pretty incredible butterfly. The silvery blue, just, you know, really aptly named. It has a silvery blue. Hmm. These are actually out right now too. I took both these photos I took uh, last week. So uh, some of these are pretty recent photos now that butterfly season's ramping up again. Um, this is a butterfly blue up at, uh, this is up at Gala Lake. So now we're starting to get into some high dwellers. Um, the Shasta blue, again, this is probably up at about 10,000 feet. Um, the Sierra blue, this is, I was, uh, again, you can see like telling the difference between these. It's, it's sometimes a matter of spots. Uh, but we have some that are, again, unique to the Sierra, which is pretty cool. Yosemite does an alpine butterfly uh, count every year, which uh, I've been following and hope to attend some year, but they have a lot of good data. This one, I think, is a square, squatted, uh, square spotted blue, but I haven't gotten confirmation yet. Um, so the blues can get quite 
confusing. Um, and then there's also the checker spots, which can equally get confusing. Um, these guys I love, they look like Dr. Seuss butterflies, I kind of call them. Look at that guy, you know, I mean, he just, they got some character. I think checker spots are the comedians of the butterfly world. Um, this is an Edis checker spot. Uh, they are not out yet, at least where I'm at. Um, they come out in force though, I'm thinking in a couple weeks, uh, maybe a little longer. So a lot of all these photos are from last year. Um, and here is some checker spots at the Merced River puddling. You can see they gather uh, in vast numbers and a variety of species. So you have, there's a, a, again, a checker spots I can ID it for really well. And then I have to get out the guidebook and, and really look at the differences. Uh, but you can see they just come out in force when it's their time. Um, this is a checker spot on the Dana Plateau. So this is at 12,000 feet. And, you know, you don't often see butterflies, you know, on snow. And that's, again, one of the things I love is they just make these incredible journeys, uh, you know, migratory journeys to their breeding grounds, to their overwintering sites, to their, you know, where they feed. And so here is a, a video of a butterfly at 12,000 feet. And they're, so they're flying over uh, you can see that's Mount Kness, and that's actually Tioga Road, um, which if you could look over that snow. Um, so you just sort of stand up there and watch them. Um, the four, um, here's a handy guide to at least some checker spots you might see uh, at the Merced River in Yosemite. And you can see a lot of it's just the coloration of how the checker spots are arranged. Uh, the northern checker spot was one that was I hadn't seen until last year. Um, but they're just, again, really beautiful, I think, clownish butterflies. And then there's the swallowtails. Oh, these guys, look at those color. And uh, this is actually a photo of three different species of, uh, of swallowtails puddling at the Merced River. And I actually have a little video here as well. Um, I actually have seen a couple. I haven't been able to get a photo. They've been moving pretty fast. Um, I saw a couple last week, which I think is a little early as well. That's why it's really interesting to me. One of the reasons I'm doing these biodiversity surveys is to see with changing climate, with increased development, with um, you know, increased recreation. And you know, the Merced River area near where I, I lived during the pandemic got trashed, especially when a lot of these agencies were closed and weren't monitoring. So, you know, I'm trying to figure out what the impacts are on wildlife. Uh, Nancy asked, what is puddling? So um, while, you know, um, butterflies and a lot of pollinators are insects. I just built a little pollinator bath where you put some pebbles and rocks and just put a really thin layer of water. Um, a, you know, they'll go after the water, but well, butterflies will go after the minerals in the soil or you'll see them feeding. Uh, you know, butterflies are beautiful, but they love poop, right? So they'll also be sort of feeding on poop, but they'll gather at these sites for, you know, sort of the water and the minerals. So it's a good place, you know, that's where, you know, butterflies are notoriously hard to photograph, but if you can find some of these, uh, like you saw with the checker spots sites that they saw, or these, they will stay still if you're still, and you can get some uh, some pretty good observations in of it. Um, but one of the things, I, the, in these swallowtail, which is one species that was in that video, now those were at a lower elevation, but these guys, again, migrate over 12,000, 11,000 feet. And indeed, one of the things I found out about these butterflies is they have territories. And um, this is a butterfly at the top of Gala Lakes Basin, a nice swallowtail, and he's just hanging out and you can hear that wind. I mean, it was, you know, I was getting blowback hiking up there and this little guy's hanging on. And then to, just to give you a context of where this butterfly is and where he's flown, there's Mount Kness and um, there's Tioga Lake. Wow, you know, what a pretty cool butterfly. But the way I discovered they have territory is I saw that butterfly and then I went back a week later and I saw a, a, another swallowtail right there. And I thought, wow, this must be a popular hangout. But it turns out it's probably the same butterfly. They will defend their little territory and the hangout and that's theirs. So he, he was sort of waiting for a mate there and hadn't found one in a week. So I sort of felt bad for him. Um, and then you make some really cool discoveries. Uh, this is a really rare species of, um, I won't even try to pronounce it, that I just luckily, you know, it was one of those like the, the goshawk I told you, snapped a photo, put it on iNaturalist and like the, you know, the butterfly folks were all over it. Oh my God, where'd you see that? What is, you know, um, so it's pretty cool. That's what I love about, um, you know, there's some good 
upsides to our electronic age and social media. And I think connecting around um, wildlife is one of them. And if you don't use iNaturalist or, or for birders, I know eBird or, or Canel, um, I've just learned, I've, you know, I'm contributing to, to other people's research, but I've also learned so much with interacting with the scientists on iNaturalist. I just think it's a, such a great platform for discovery as well as research. The Sierra Sulphur, if you're ever up hiking, it's another, we, it's, it's actually a pretty imperiled butterfly. We only have it here. And this was another one. I'm like, oh, a green butterfly, how cool. Not knowing it was this butterfly that researchers were really interested in. And uh, again, really, really beautiful animal. And you can see uh, that's my iNaturalist map. I was um, really the lone sighting in right there in the Yosemite area of this for a while, so. Another one, the Milbert's tortoise shell. Uh, this was at Gala Lakes Basin, just a beautiful color. Um, and then you get into the coppers. You know, I don't know who names these guys. I don't see much copper about some of these, but you know, we'll take it. There's the Edith copper, the lustrous copper, which is a pretty familiar hike. If you do do hiking in Yosemite uh, at the high country, this is an early season butterfly. You'll see quite a bit lustrous copper. And then another group of butterflies that, you know, drive me crazy trying to ID the specific species because it's all about like one dot being different on the other of the fritillaries. And these are some of the last butterflies you'll see hanging out. Um, last time I actually, I was up at Toga Pass before it closed. I actually still saw a couple. So they sort of hang around late season. And then again, I won't try to pronounce this uh, anyway, but this is another beautiful in, um, butterfly, the Pranastian. Um, that I see in the high elevations. I just love the, the coloration. But there's a bright, there's a couple um, bridles on this. One is we have our own, the Sierra Nevada, and I was lucky enough to cite one, which was rare, but rarer still. Um, oh, I thought I had the Rocky Mountain. Let's see. Oh, I must not have it. I just cited a Rocky Mountain, uh, which is pr pretty rare for this area. I thought it was a Sierra Nevada one, but uh, again, these beautiful white butterflies are something you'll see in the high country. And then I think a lot of us, if you've seen a butterfly up here, it's probably the California tortoise shell. They are the ones doing these incredible migrations. Um, you see them you know, down in the Central Valley. This is on the Dana Plateau, all these butterflies trying to make go. And then uh, this one I like, especially for Fresno Audubon, because the white line sphinx, it, it looks like a hummingbird, right? This is, I call it a bird moth. And uh, I think a lot of gardeners, uh, I think it's a tomato worm is what a lot of gardeners treat as pests and give them some tomatoes because this is what they turn into. They're incredibly beautiful creatures. And then I put these up. These are uh, somebody put that moths aren't as pretty. Uh, actually, these aren't moths, but I uh, that again the, the white line sphinx was. Um, but these are not. These are called skippers, a type of butterfly, and a lot of people um, see them but don't know quite. They move a little differently than regular butterflies, and these are two species that are up in the high country. And then I'll end my uh, butterfly exploratory again with a, a really uh, rare species in the Sierra, um, this Chichis arctic, and. Um, Look at the color of that butterfly and look at the color of granite. Um, these are really hard to see. I was impressed I found one. And uh, indeed, they, you know, they're not a butterfly that's going to land on flowers, right? We tend to think a butterfly like on flowers and greenery. These guys spend a lot of time just on the rocks. So it's pretty special to see one. And again, it, it, it takes some patience because you can see they blend in pretty well with the granite. And then I'll end sort of our really rapid tour of butterflies there with what, again, why I like them. Um, this was a, a butterfly up at Gale Lakes Basin at the end of the season. And, uh, you know, it gets to the resiliency again, like the pika. This guy almost had no wing left. And butterflies, they don't regrow wings. They lose a ring or, you know, they, they come out fully formed and, and they're not going to regenerate growth. And this guy was still going like it, you know he was going to keep going to the end and i think the resiliency of wild creatures especially in challenging times like this like if that butterfly can still fly at twelve thousand feet with a wing like that uh, i think i can make it through this pandemic so i think the wild world has really given me a lot of inspiration during these times um you know we talk a lot about um wildlife in yosemite i think probably the megafauna most associate yosemite with is the black bear and when i started working in yosemite in 1999 um, one of my first projects was working on the keep bears wild project which um, those of you who visit yosemite know it was a just a huge issue with 
bears uh, breaking into cars, causing property damage, getting food. And I love that the park was like, wait a minute, this isn't a bear problem, it's a people problem. And when you turned it around and act, asked the people if they wanted to visit Yosemite, they had to do things to ensure that wildlife stayed safe. Boy, the, the problem got solved. And uh, that was really rewarding to work on. And to this day, I mean, it takes a lot of work you know, education, you can't let up, but, you know, the, the, uh, they're having a lot less bear incidents in um, Yosemite uh, Valley. So uh, in Yosemite overall, the next step is how do you get the gateway communities? Uh, you know, the bears don't know the boundaries, but this is a black bear in my yard. My little front door is about 10 feet from here uh, saying hello. And then this was last fall, this bear pose. This is um, my other wildlife camera um, about 50 feet from the house. He was posing. <laughs> it's pretty incredible. Um, people are putting up, yes, there was a bear recently spotted in Eagle Rock in LA. I mean, he was in the, he was in the suburbs, you know, he was gonna hit Trader Joe's. He's still there and he's still making the news. Uh, and uh, an interesting, interesting factoid about LA bears. So a lot of the bears um, from Yosemite in the 50s and, and around that time, the ones they labeled bad bears, they would relocate down south. So a lot of uh, the uh, Los Angeles area bear population comes from Yosemite stock, which is pretty interesting. So I wanted to tell two bear stories here about my time in the park. Uh, this is, uh, remember how I said I had to work for those Yosemite toads? Um, this is what you have to walk to over in, if you want to do pika sighting or Yosemite toad sighting before it is melted out. And so this is me sitting on my pika sighting rock, that's Scalar Lake frozen over. And I'm sitting there one day and I'm like, what is that across the lake? And this coyote starts trotting across the lake. And I'm like, wow, that's pretty cool. And about, and I should add that bald eagle photo same this is this i wanted i i win i won the wildlife sighting on the internet this day this was all within an hour then a bald eagle flies over and i'm watching the pika and then i see this dot across the lake and i'm like is that another coyote and i'm like oh no it's it's a bear and this guy came he wanted to watch pika with me so he sort of walked across the lake walked by and it's just so incredible to see a wild bear doing wild things and and coming out especially in springtime um and then this was another cool bear encounter. This was on the Kuna Crest. And uh, the funny story about this is, uh, you know, I was hiking. The Kuna Crest is, is quite a bit to get up to. You're, you know, you, you gotta, uh, you take the mono pass trail, but you have to cut cross country and it's a long way up. It's, uh, and I, I, I get to this sort of basin and I'm looking down and I'm, I see four different bear poop you know bear scat and I'm like oh okay this must be a popular bear hangout and I get to the last one I'm like boy this looks a little fresh and I start looking around and I look up and there's the bear looking at me like oh you caught me pooping uh so it was pretty cool he he you know sort of checked me out for a little bit and then uh again bear butts are probably just as cute as pika butts that I'm out of here and uh but it was such a great wild encounter to be out there with that and indeed um I, uh, around that area, this was another trip, I spotted five different um, bear poops as well, which I reported to the Yosemite bear biologists. So uh, apparently that area is a pretty active bear area. Uh, so the last animal I wanna end with is an aspirational one, which is the gray wolf. And I am so happy that I can actually put this on a list of almost Yosemite wildlife. But I don't know if you've heard the news, but uh, there was a wolf spotted, uh, for, at least from my house, a mere 50 miles from my house uh, as the crow flies, and even closer, I'd say about 30 to 40 miles to the border of Yosemite. And this is OR93. He is uh, a wolf from Oregon that they've been tracking, and he made it uh, all the way down to the Sierra. And I am just in overjoyed over the moon that now uh, every morning when I wake up, I probably have a chance it is a, a wolf might howl or my next hike in Yosemite, I might see a wolf. Um, if you don't know the story of wolves, uh, I spent um, time working in Yellowstone and I, I uh, just did a talk with Doug Smith, who's become a friend if you want to, if you're interested in wolves online, uh, who headed up the Yosemite Wolf Project and they've got 25 years of research. And I'll tell you, 
there was something life-changing about being in the wild um, with wolves and being on a hike and seeing wolves and hearing them howl uh, that I am so happy that the Sierra is now going to have. These are actually a couple photos from uh, that's a photo from a wolf in Yellowstone. But what started wolves in California were actually descendants of those Yellowstone wolves. So we have not had wolves in California in 100 years or 90 years, so almost 100 years, until OR7, this is our hero, he crossed the California state line in 2011. And we were, at the time, a lot of us were tracking it and cheering him on, like, is he going to cross the state line? And he, he crossed over and hung out a bit in Northern California. But we like to joke, like a lot of Californians, he went back to Oregon to, to raise his family. But he was a descendant of the wolves that they reintroduced in Yellowstone in Idaho in 1995. So that reintroduction spurred a return of wolves to California. But uh, but what showed up were more wolves. There was a, a you know, pack started showing up in Northern California. So he sort of led the, the uh, sort of set the wolf highway for this to happen. And wow, we have wolves and we will be hearing wolves howl in Yosemite Valley pretty soon. Um, I'll skip through this. There's a lot of great, uh, there's a report by um, Sonoma State and the California, there's a great article and you can Google um, Defenders of Wildlife where Malcolm Margolin and his co-author um, talk about the indigenous um, uh, accounts of wolves here and their traditions around it. And this report by Sonoma State also outlines that. And then the California Department of Fish and Wildlife has a report that talks about some of the historical sightings of wolves here. Even uh, William Brewer accounted seeing wolves uh, in Tuolumne Meadows, which I think again is exciting to contemplate. We will be seeing that again. And where I live in the Central Sierra based on the biological conditions is the primo place where wolves are probably gonna re-inhabit. So those of you in Fresno, you don't have to go to Yellowstone to wolf watch anymore. You're gonna be able to wolf watch in Yosemite pretty soon. And here's another wolf that I uh, encountered in Yellowstone. And I just think wolves make the landscape a little wilder and I'm just, so happy that now, pretty soon, Yosemite books are going to have to include the gray wolf in uh, Predator That Returns Home. So anyway, I rushed through a lot of that fast. I think we have a little time for questions. And I will also, here's my email if I don't get to your question. Or here's all my contact information. Um, but I really appreciate you all spending some time with me tonight to talk about um, Wild Wonder. Um, so um, I don't know. Um, did, did you want to moderate? Do you just want me to, to look at the questions there? How do you guys usually handle this? I want to follow procedure. <laughs> um, I think if anyone has um, any questions, go ahead and put them in the chat box. Okay. And now, I will look, um, let's see what we have for questions here. Uh, somebody just says iPhone. I know you did a live stream about wolves a couple months ago, but I think we should do another one. Uh, about the recent wolf activity. Yes, uh, I just actually did, I think it was February or January, I can't remember now, it was the month of wolves. I talked about uh, California wolves and I had Doug Smith on, but I agree, um, this is good, probably gonna warrant another talk on how close wolves are to, you know, to Yosemite and to the Sierra and how they are coming back fast. Um, we have a question, I'm aware of the movement to restore, rehabilitate, um, in so far as possibly the LA River, how will that impact the wildlife there? So, you know, the LA River is really interesting and I have to admit, I don't know all the details. There's a lot of um, different restoration efforts from very urban to very non-urban, um, but the LA River is an interesting river. As you know, we, those of us who weren't El Angelinos and I was one of them knew it from movies like Grease and The Terminator. But it's really interesting, like you go from a concrete channel to then you turn the other way and it looks like a river in Yosemite. It's just this wild place. Um, so I think a lot of the restoration efforts, uh, you know, can only be good at reclaiming some habitat for wildlife. But of course, when anything humans are doing, we do have to monitor it. But I love that land is being reclaimed. My organization is, is helping in that peripherally in that we sponsor some trail cams in partnership with the National Park Service to start getting baseline data on what's already in the LA River corridor so that when some of these restoration efforts happen, you know, we know how to best accommodate wildlife or see how these restoration um, efforts are, are affecting them. So um, the, let's see what else do we have. 
Uh, oh, Anne, thank you. Yes, I, I do tend to get enthusiastic about wildlife. I hope people appreciate it. Sometimes my energy can be annoying, but thank you for appreciating it. Um, uh, someone else says, my information about the impending extinction of pica may be erroneous. So this is one of those, I'd say it's complicated. Um, I actually, I'm so excited. Again, I'm, I consider myself a scientist. I have a biology field undergrad, but I, you know, I'm more a practicing scientist for myself. It's not my job with the National Wildlife Federation to do research per se, although I do a little, uh, I've collared them out in line and stuff, but um, but I just was named in my first scientific paper as a, a co-author, one of many for pica. And um, I think the you know original hypothesis was pica, you know, climate change, pica are, are critters that do not like the heat and uh, beyond not being able to tolerate the heat, obviously, the heat and climate change impacts affect their habitat and vegetation and things like that. So the hypothesis for a while was as it gets hotter, they're going to go up slope. And at some point, it be called like the Jacob's ladder hypothesis, they're going to have nowhere upslope to go and they're going to go up to heaven and goodbye pica. Um, I think there's no doubt in my mind, based on the science, that climate change is impacting them, but it's not impacting all populations equally. Some have the ability to switch to habitat, you know, like the Gala Lakes pica I was showing you, they are in habitat, they're near a lake, they have plenty of water, the vegetation's good, where a population of pica that don't have perhaps that water source, you know, that loss of quality of vegetation, vegetation is going to impact them. Snowpack is a big thing for pica. Um, a too little snowpack, they don't have insulation from the elements. So, you know, that's one thing that's impacting up here. But, you know, some areas may maintain snowpack longer than others based on the little microclimate. So I think what we're seeing now is it's complicated. It's not as, you know, universal as all pica are going to go up slope. Um, but there's still no doubt. I think there's going to be a threshold where none of them are going to be able to tolerate it. So um, that's also a thing. Another thing they're seeing is they're switching to forage perhaps at night or once the sun goes down instead of, instead of during the day to help escape the heat. So some of them are developing, I think, adaptation strategies. Um, what type of camera am I using? I use a, um, a Browning. Um, Oh God, what's the recon? Um, and Trail Cam Pro is a, a great site that has a lot of trail cameras. They're really coming down in price. Uh, it's about 150, the ones I use, which is not bad for the video quality I get. Um, and then uh, Anne asked about monarch butterflies. Yes, I am doing work on monarch butterflies. And so is my organization, the National Wildlife Federation. Um, I didn't throw them in here on purpose. I didn't want to get too depressing, but um, we're actually, I just organized sort of really in a very rapid manner, a bio blitz up here in Mariposa County um, because the Western uh, Xerce Society and my own organization, we don't have a lot of data on monarch population counts in their breeding sites, right? The foothills, um, you know, so Fresno, you know, places like that. We have a lot of good data on the overwintering, you know, the coast. Um, so they're looking for this data. So I'm like, all right, we're going to do a bio blitz up here. But if you, you know, those of you who may not have heard, the monarch butterfly population, especially in California, is on its way out. You're down from millions and millions of butterflies to the last count was 2,000. I mean, that that is insane that we could let these guys go on, on our watch. And um, it's, you know, so... Um, the more uh, people can help, I think what we always do a call to native plants, especially your local native milkweed, um, and also um, not using pesticides, you know, all the things, this group knows that, but this is, this is a butterfly that we may see go out on our watch, and that really saddens me, so um, let's, uh, let's end on something, um, oh, Barbara says, are there any concerns about the safety of gray wolves as they return to Yosemite? Are they protected by state federal law? This is why I love to live in California. Um, even if, uh, so as you know, wolves have been sort of on and off the federal endangered species list. Um, and we saw what just happened in Wisconsin, which I am just sick over. But good news is this is California. Um, even before uh, wolves were permanently here, when OR7 crossed the state line, and even when he went back to raise his family in Oregon, our California Fish and Game Commission took the visionary step of putting wolves on the state endangered species list before they were even permanently a resident here. I think that was 2015. So um, 
all the wolves here, whether they're in the park or not in the park, are protected by our state endangered species list. So that gives me a lot of hope. And I also will say, I don't think you'll see a Wisconsin. 80% uh, of Californians support wolves being here. So, you know, those are not numbers you see in other states. So I'm very hopeful that we have to help people coexist with wolves. There's no doubt they, you know, for people who are ranching and who or have uh, livestock, we have to help them coexist and give them the tools to do so. But on the other hand, I, I'm very optimistic about the public's reception of wolves here and that they'll they'll be safe and 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 have a really good chance of being successful in in, in repopulating the area.